In this lecture, we're going to talk about herbivory as a management tool. And Aldo called that the cow. But that's what he meant was that we can use herbivory to augment wildlife habitat in some particular circumstances if you're using herbivory in particular ways. So uh, I've talked about herbivores interacting with uh, fire quite a bit. And I think that's important for you to get some context. So this is a map that you may have seen if you've taken my other class. Uh, some of the things in this lecture I talked about in that other class. And uh, if you, you'll be familiar with it if you've taken wildlife ecology and management with me. However, uh, if you haven't seen it, I think it's important for us to go over it so that you understand the context historically for this fire herbivore interaction. So this term that I have circled on this historical map is the term Grande Savane, which loosely interprets to Big Savannah. Now remember what we talked about with uh, Big Savannah and uh, Woodlands and the previous lectures, this is essentially this open forest structure with an early successional herbaceous dominated community at the understory level, right? That structure is really important for uh, a lot of our wildlife species in the east. So uh, if you look at look up these terms, this is uh, some definitions that you might find. When I think of savanna, normally I'm envisioning something like this. You can see uh, there are trees, but they're pretty sparse. Most of the area is getting full sunlight, and the, the understory strata here is mainly grass from what we can tell, right? So this would be uh, that iconic savanna. So apparently uh, some of these early explorers thought that a large portion of the unit, United States uh, was Grand Savannah. And the pink here is essentially what they mapped out. First of all, look how accurate the map is with some of these structures. It's pretty incredible given uh, the tools that they had to draw it. Uh, you can see down into Florida there we have pink. And uh, this is what they called Grande Savane. So you can see that is a huge proportion of the eastern United States, essentially from the tall grass prairie east, for the most part, uh, was characterized as this. So some interesting things about that, uh, we know from other places on Earth where we still have intact savannas, that there's a unique role that is played by fire and herbivory interacting in this system. And essentially, uh, there have been some large scale experiments, and that's what I'm showing you here with this paper, that uh, if you have a savanna system and you take fire out of the system, even if you leave the mega herbivores in the system, it still transitions into something that's not savanna. All right. So the interesting thing about that is if you leave fire in the system and take the mega herbivores out in these savanna systems, they also transition into something that's not savanna. So it tells us something about that interaction is really important to suppress the recruitment of trees. So what that is called is the fire herbivory trap. And there's been a whole bunch of literature on this. I've worked on it and some of our systems uh, you've seen some of that data <coughs> in the fire lecture, but essentially what's happening is fire is repeatedly top killing plants, and those are very attractive for her herbivores when they're re sprouting, and the herbivore continuously keeps cropping it back and keeping it in a shorter stature in trapping it or bottlenecking it in that, that uh, short you know, uh, stature, and then it's more vulnerable to fire when it occurs again. So uh, we know from a, a bunch of systems that these things were intact. 
This is a map of, of Woods Bison. Uh, so somebody went through all of these uh, historical accounts and different places that were named different things based on the occurrence of, of buffalo or bison. And uh, you can see that they actually match the that uh, what was called Grande Savane. Uh, it's pretty interesting that we know that the bison came all the way down into central Florida. I had no idea before I started doing some research for this lecture that that was the case. But apparently uh, fire and this large herbivore were interacting on the landscape and uh, we know that was probably pretty important and now it's absent from the system. Okay, so uh, because of that interaction, we probably had that savanna structure and we uh, most likely have some issues from a management standpoint because of the lack of that interaction. But all that to say, uh, we can use grazing or herbivory to affect plant community structure in some cases uh, in desirable ways to promote wildlife habitat. The three primary things that we are manipulating are the selectivity of the herbivore, so what is it eating, and you could do that by changing the context with the herbivore, or uh, you could do that by changing which herbivore you, you're using, uh, the timing of that herbivory, and then the intensity of it. All right, so these are the three primary uh, things that we would manipulate. So uh, it, this is another really important graph for you to grasp and understand well. And essentially, herbivores are grouped into these three broad categories. You can see white-tailed deer up at the top left. They are considered concentrate selectors. Essentially what that means is they select particular plant parts of particular plant species to maximize the quality of the, the uh, foliage that's being taken in. That's pretty common of things that eat broadleaf plants primarily. If you look at the extreme opposite side, that's roughage grazers. Those are things uh, like the prairie bison, sheep, ox, uh, a lot of things that are eating primarily grass. You can see cattle down at the bottom right. So they are much less selective of particular plant parts and plant species. They're generally eating grass and uh, grass across species of grasses remain relatively similar in quality, at least as it compares to broadly plants like white-tailed deer navigating uh, woody and herbaceous broadleaf plants, there is an enormous variation in the quality of leaves. So that requires them to be much more highly selective of what they eat. The intermediate feeders are somewhere in the middle and generally uh, they have a high proportion of their diet at some times of the year will be grass and at other times of the year will be broadly plants generally. So that's uh, pretty common of elk. Uh, notice the, the woods bison uh, right here in kind of the middle on the right. They're right, you know, they're, they're basically just barely considered intermediate feeders because they did intake uh, more, they did intake some broadly plants compared to uh, those that uh, you know, those other ones that are roughage grazers. So uh, here, uh, throughout this presentation, I have uh, some things in here and telling you where they're coming from for you to look at. I'm not gonna talk about all these tables in detail, but I wanted you to have this information uh, that you can use to, to understand how you would use grazing. So, I've been involved in a bunch of cool experiments uh, with some of these herbivores, uh, particularly white-tailed deer, and this is an experiment where we actually uh, were testing some principles of diet selection and how deer were determining what to eat. And uh, this is one of our 
or Bucks, his name was Lucky, and Lucky him, he uh, was getting to try all these cool forages that we had gone and picked for him. Uh, but it really has been remarkable to me trying to understand the diet selection process because uh, it really, it, it will blow your mind how these different things, check out the sky posing like this. Uh, it's pretty remarkable to understand how the body is working and that's not just for animals, but also for humans. So uh, this experiment was one that really blew my mind. And I know that uh, you prob this is probably uh, fresh on your mind if you took wildlife ecology and management with me, but if you didn't, I wanna go back over it because it's just a really, really awesome experiment. The kind of thing that we can't do now. It's called the uh, Clara's Kids Study. And you, here's the citation down. I would encourage you to go and look that up and read the paper. It's really, really interesting. But essentially, uh, they were trying to figure out, do, do people have this ability, this innate ability, ability to select among different diet items to mix a diet uh, that, that uh, is appropriate? And it sure seems, I, I know I feel like this a lot, it sure seems like humans don't have that ability or, or we've lost touch with it or, or something along those lines. But this experiment was pretty entailing to me and it actually uh, tells you a lot about how the diet selection process works. So in this study, uh, essentially Clara, the Miss Clara was uh, managing this orphanage that was taking in really young children. They were uh, newly weaned infants, as you can see down in the, the bottom. And she basically brought these children in and she provided them ad libitum these items that you can see on the right. Notice some of this stuff is kind of weird, like bone marrow and bone jelly. That's not something that I just have sitting around that I snack on during, you know, every day. Uh, you know, there, some of these things are kind of weird is my point, but these were literally infant age children that were coming into this place. And she was basically trying to provide all of these, these whole foods and letting them basically choose however they please. They can use as much or as little or eat whenever they want as much or as little or drink or whatever, all of these items at any time of the day uh, with, with no oversight essentially. And what happened with that was pretty remarkable. I mean, I think about my kids and I'm, you know, could, could they actually survive on their own? And sometimes I feel like uh, my five-year-old in particular, she would basically eat nothing but chocolate and candy. That's what it, you know, I feel like. But, uh, you know, seeing this experiment is just really telling because what happened is all of the kids actually mixed a diet that was unique to themselves. And it was pretty remarkable. I feel like this EH here, that's that's actually probably my kid because man, you wanna talk about somebody that loves milk and dairy. That, I feel like that's all she'll eat other than candy is milk and dairy. And uh, you can see that this kid, uh, you know, the majority of the intake was, was uh, milks. So, uh, but notice this is just three examples of different children in the study and they varied markedly in what they were consuming. So that was one of the take home points. They all ate their own ration and their own, you know, their, their own amounts of each food and mixed it differently. Another thing that was pretty remarkable is by all indications after uh, doing this for six months or more, 
all of the children were in immaculate health and uh, based on every metric that they measured them on something else that was pretty remarkable some of them came in like as infants with nutritional born diseases and they cured themselves by selecting their own diet so i thought that uh, it would be fun to, for us to have a, a nice discussion about this topic because it generally is pretty interesting but uh it's pretty remarkable to think that some of these kids came in with these diseases and again we're talking about you know this kid came in as a nine and a half month old child and uh had cured himself by the time uh, he was 14 months old with no oversight just being provided all these things there have been some other cases where stuff like this has happened uh so this was an example of some some folks that got stranded on a an island and they were in a situation where there was all this stuff available for them to eat but they didn't really have any experience with any of the foods and uh, they were eating all this weird stuff on this island and one whoops, excuse me uh, one of them actually died from uh, so some nutritional born problems we think and the other one was in good health when people found him so uh all that to say there there are a couple of things uh to gather from all of that research one individuals have their own nutritional demands and even humans have this innate ability to select among foods that meet those nutritional demands when we actually look at the studies of wildlife uh, looking at diet selection and what is actually driving animals to select between different foods uh, we can see this same pattern where animals seem to have this innate ability to select foods that fulfill nutritional demands and another interesting thing is you, you may be thinking oh they're trying to maximize the intake of whatever nutrient is, is limiting. Well, that's only partially true. Uh, some of our research with deer and the research of others with a, a bunch of different herbivore species have demonstrated pretty well that it's not just about maximizing a limiting nutrient, it's also about simultaneously not exceeding toxicity. In fact, that's more important. Uh, you're, you instinctively avoid things that will poison you right you can only be poisoned once and it could kill you whereas you could maintain a deficiency in a nutrient for extended periods of time animals will kind of formulate selection based on those principles avoid toxicity at all cost and then secondarily try to meet the nutritional demands of uh, your limiting nutrients some, so how, how do animals do that? How do we do that? Well, there's actually really good data on this showing that there is a nutritional feedback. It's called a post-ingestive feedback. And the idea is that you intake some foods and you're, you, know, you process those foods and your digestive tract actually gives your brain a feedback on those things that you eat which then encourage you to eat those things when you need the particular nutrients or uh, compounds that it was uh, providing and, and uh, to me that at face value that seems really awesome and it's like oh man that's cool but then I take a step back and it's like wait a minute what if you eat a whole bunch of foods for a meal how, how does your body know which food goes with which nutrients it, you know, it doesn't really make sense but if we want to add to the confusion and uh, think about how little this makes sense there's actually been some really cool documented cases of these digestive feedbacks with with people that uh, received organ transplants and in particular there are some there were people that had a really strong affinity for a particular food and then they get an organ transplant and lose the affinity but the particular potentially more weird circumstances is when people have gotten organs donated from a person who had a really strong preference for something that the the organ uh, recipient did not 
and then they inherited that that uh, dietary preference from the organ donor, which is pretty weird. That that just makes me like you know have to step back and take take a minute to think about that. But this has been pretty well documented in the literature, and uh, it it makes the strong point. Uh, some of the literature, uh, particularly with herbivores, has shown very distinct patterns that are consistent with that idea that the body is taking feedbacks from the organs and then those feedbacks are somehow reinforcing the preference for those items uh, you know by rearranging your your thought process and brain and your, your innate ability to choose among those foods now we can talk about uh, you know why or why not we think we can or can't do this now. I think it's a great discussion topic, but uh, the research surrounding this topic, especially with animals, is pretty overwhelming, and herbivores are great model species. So uh, with that being said, this is a complex thing to try to manage. You know, we're trying to get animals to select particular plant species. Uh, the timing of that could be critical to drive animals to select particular plant species to suppress them, or you may want to release uh, other plant species that are desirable. The intensity, the species of herbivore that you use, the density that you uh, graze them at, and uh, the timing can all be pretty critical elements of success. Um, the other thing is that the you know preferences of the animal could drive what uh, you actually observe in these populations. So uh, you know you may see animals with uh, or that are particularly young may have certain preferences versus uh, one you know uh, pregnant individuals are very different from from uh, you know other adults. That, you know there are all sorts of things that are affecting whether you know how preference plays out and the preference can play an important role in which plant species are suppressed or promoted the intensity is uh, particularly if you're using a non-selective grazing uh, animal they're particularly the, the intensity is particularly important because it's driving how much biomass of plants will be removed from in that system it's not really driving as much uh, which plants but just how much of the plant community as a whole the so one thing that you may not have realized yet but I want to make very clear you know choosing the the more selective uh, herbivores for these types of practices can help you be more selective in which plant species uh, you suppress or promote whereas uh, the, the less selective herbivores might just help better control the amount of biomass of plants that is present. So very pretty important distinction. We don't use this as much in this part of the world as in others, but uh, you know the, the uh, intensity in interacting with the selectivity is a very important part of grazing management systems. <clears throat> so a couple of ways that we do use it in the South. I, I love these, you know, uh, thinking about the, the kudzu and uh, goat busters. I, I've actually seen these on the side of the road. So this is an invasive plant species, uh, kudzu that you've probably seen a lot if you've been around the South. You may not have known that's what it was, but uh, it's a pretty problematic species and goats have been prescribed to control those. Uh, it's pretty interesting goats. They're uh, just an interesting thing to be around if you never have. But uh, they will literally eat all of the, the kudzu if they can reach it. Another interesting thing about goats, just an interesting anecdote from my childhood. Uh, when I was a kid, my, my grandfather had this had a bunch of goats and he had this uh, this big American holly tree that that 
had gotten blown over by wind and it was sort of at a not quite a 45 degree angle it was a little steeper than that but it was not quite steep enough where the goats couldn't walk up the stem and it was pretty interesting because I remember multiple occasions when I was a kid going to his house and seeing the goats up in the canopy of the American holly eating the leaves out of the canopy. Uh, just a, an interesting anecdote, but they can be a really effective species for this prescribed uh, herbivory approach like this. So this is pretty common how we might use it in the south is to control invasive plant species like this. Uh, it may be used more commonly out in the tall grass prairie, for instance, just to manage the amount of biomass of plants that are that are present. But so uh, you don't have to just use one species. You could use several, or at least more than one species, uh, based on their diet preferences or uh, which plants are toxic or not to different species. There are lots of ways that, that uh, you can manipulate these kinds of systems. And uh, again, we don't use it as much in the South, but it's certainly a great management tool, particularly in grasslands that we use pretty commonly. Uh, there are some challenges to adding multiple species. It, it may be, uh, they may be aggressive toward one another or they need different, they have different requirements from a nutrient standpoint, different requirements to keep them uh, in a fence, for instance, so there there are some challenges to having multiple species, but it can be really valuable, particularly if there are multiple problematic plant species that you're trying to control. Uh, these are the general invasive plant species management options uh, that we would use grazing for. And uh, you can read through these on your own. I wanted to provide you all the information and, and where I got it from uh, so that you can review it. But uh, the main thing is this is a common method that can be used to control invasive species. Sometimes we do that by integrating methods. So for instance, uh, grazing might be used with chemical methods or prescribed burning and uh, you've already been thinking a lot about using burning to prep biomass for uh, grazing, but it could be the opposite as well, where we graze places to reduce the biomass to uh, facilitate the use of prescribed fire, or uh, you may be able to use one to make the plant, the problematic plant species vulnerable to the other. A, another common thing that's done is to use grazing to make plants, you know, they basically could top kill or injure the plants and make them uh, vulnerable to chemical methods. So using herbicides, particularly if you graze it and then they're re-sprouting and that succulent tissue often takes up the chemical much easier than, than the older tissue. Or you may actually use herbicide to weaken the plant's defenses so that it's vulnerable to grazing. So that's just a couple of examples of how we might uh, manipulate or yeah, manipulate these integrated methods to uh, target specific problems. <clears throat> Something that you're more familiar with is this concept of pirate herbivory. And uh, this is actually really common in the tall grass prairie, and it's becoming more common in the, the uh, south as well, where we're actually trying to allow fire and herbivory to interact like they did naturally to promote a, a suite of species and diversity in plant and animal communities. The cool thing about this, the experiments out in the Midwest that, that uh, they've implemented this type of strategy, show benefits basically from every aspect that they've measured from decreasing insect pest to increasing plant diversity and bird diversity and all sorts of things, more efficient nutrient cycling, all kinds of things uh, from integrating fire and herbivory and letting them interact. <clears throat> So the idea with that is you, you basically have fire come through, it reduces plant biomass, the re-sprouting vegetation is 
is uh, increasing in value and uh, the herbivore is then attracted to that biomass and then reduces that biomass, which decreases the probability of fire happening in the future. Okay, so uh, the probability of fire and the probability of se selection there are just showing you the, the, fire ver the fire returning versus the herbivore selecting uh, this area. This has been formulated into a management approach that is called patch burn grazing. I uh, always like this picture in the bottom right. It's just showing you, it, it, you know, it's kind of a, a view at how tightly coupled cattle are with fire. They're literally just standing in it, waiting it for it to go through. But in this patch burn grazing model, there are a couple of things that are absolutely critical for this to work right. Okay. So what we typically do in an agricultural setting when we're managing beef cattle uh, is we move those cattle from pasture to pasture and they are basically kept in that pasture with fencing. So we are determining where and when and for how long and at what density those herbivores are on that pasture. In the patch burn grazing model, we might take those, let's say we had three areas that were rotating cows through. Instead of having cross fences that separate those three, in the patch burn grazing model, we would allow them access to all of the area at the same time. That's one thing that is absolutely critical. They have to have free choice of where to eat. The second part of that is we are moving animals to where we want them to eat by using fire. So you burn through a uh, field and it starts to re-sprout and the uh, herbivores are attracted to that and they start to follow fire around. And basically you just keep rotating where fire occurs and then allow the cows to eat wherever they want. And when you have that sort of interaction working well, that's when we see these increases in diversity and improvement in nutrient cycling because the system is functioning like it would have naturally with herbivores following fire around the system. <clears throat> so here's just uh, showing you that same thing about the patch burn grazing approach. Remember, uh, these three characteristics on the left are very important for the success of it and particularly important is to allow animals free choice of the pastures rather than, than uh, moving them between fenced pastures. This same kind of process works in, uh, in our savanna systems and this is kind of showing you how that works. Basically, you have a seedling that gets top killed by fire. Here, I'm showing you a picture of a red maple that is stump sprouting after being top killed, and the herbivore is devouring it, in this case, white-tailed deer. And uh, essentially, what happens is the fire creates this stump sprout. You have this really intensive herbivory that traps that plant in the understory, and then fire is much more successful at killing that plant into the future and you end up with this savanna stable state because of the fire herbivore interaction. If you've never heard of the piney woods cows, you should definitely go look those up. They're really awesome. They're kind of, they're just this miniature cow. Uh, we had bred them, uh, let's see, I think it was, uh, DeSoto bred them to fit in boats so they could bring a bunch with them when they were settling Florida. And uh, basically when they got here, they turned them loose and left them for, you know, they were free roaming cows for a couple hundred years. So they, these cows adapted to that system and now they actually, uh, they're called Piney Woods cows. They actually ate a, a balanced diet of of uh, herbaceous plants between broadleaf and uh, grasses. So that's pretty cool, first of all. Second of all, this is a really cool species that we actually do use to some extent to manage uh, vegetation 
communities in the south and longleaf in particular and these cows are really well adapted to eat the plants that are associated with with that system and uh i think it's just really cool that the cow the cattle operations that you may be familiar with or that you see when you're going down the road generally those are using about a, a cow they're grazing at an intensity of about a cow per two acres or more uh, in this kind of system, if we were going to use pitch perm grazing and manage the system to be really uh, productive from a wildlife standpoint, we would be at way lower of a density, so like a cow per 10 acres. All right, so we go from two cows per acre to a cow per 10 acres, so that's far different. Another thing that's interesting is because they're adapted really well to the plants that they're eating in this system as opposed to our European uh, breeds uh, they don't they, it's a low input system you don't have to uh, you don't have to supplement them with with nutrients or or uh, you know the the antibiotics and other stuff that we have to put into those other system another cool thing about it is it is a delicacy meat and uh, there are markets for that where uh, this could be a really profitable thing for landowners uh, if, if they're interested in engaging in this. There are quite a few places uh, in Florida and, and uh, across the Piney Woods region that are doing this type of approach and it's really cool. So hopefully we'll get a, a chance to talk about this with some people that are implementing it. But uh, I thought it'd be really interesting for you, especially if you wanna go and look up these Piney Woods cows and, and read about them. They're, they're really, really awesome.